Thank you. And first, I want to really thank the organizers for inviting me here. So it's not so common for a grad student to have a chance to go around and talk about the, the thesis project. And so this is what, I, what I'm going to do today. And so I'm like extremely eager to hear like impression and comments about it. I mean, if not during the talk, like later in any other time in these days, that's like what PhD, like what graduate school is about in the end. So, and feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have any questions. So, so what I want to start with is some sort of historical and motivational introduction. And okay, by the way, the first thing I want to say is that everything I'm going to say is going to be over the field of complex numbers. So I don't know if anybody can see like the corner down there. And this is like the sort of stuff that can get like different in positive characteristics. But so I believe we can substitute C with any um, algebraically closed field of characteristic zero, but let's stick with C. That's, that's what I'm gonna do. Now, so I want to start this historical introduction in the, in the 19th century where people were were enjoying themselves with questions as the ones that you see at the blackboard. Like, the first question is how many conics in the, in the projective plane are tangent to five general conics, okay? And other questions like related to twisted cubic, how many twisted cubics are tangent to 12 planes or meet 12 lines or are tangent to 12 general quadric surfaces? So these are the questions that they, they were asking the questions and they, they also solved a few of them, if not all of them. So, so I want to talk about like, how they thought they were thinking about these problems. There's a way that's not really rigorous as today we would call a proof, but in some sense it, it was working. So, so about, first thing I want to say is about question one, a little bit of history of how question one got solved. So, so the main thing that they, they were using was, so the main tool they were using is that taking the product of conditions. So what they, what they used to solve these problems were taking products of conditions. And today we, were, we would say that this is the intersection product of divisors. But there, they only had these symbols that they multiplied getting some numbers. That's something that has some sort of magic, like, Behind. So the first approach to solve this problem that's due to Schultz in 18, sorry, that's due to Steiner in 1848 was this, okay? So we consider a conic. A conic is just, it's just given by six, six projective, six projective like parameters. Why is that? We can consider just the polynomial defining a conic in P2. It has six coefficients, and then we take the projective space, okay? So we can consider a conic as given by these six projective parameters, and the condition, like, let's call like sigma i, the condition of tangency to, to the conic ci, this is like really the condition that we impose on a, con a smooth conic to be tangent to a given conic CI, okay? So this is from I goes from one to five. These are the five conics we want to, we want to use, okay? So this condition here is a degree six polynomial condition um, in in our six parameters. Um, if you really try to express this condition, this becomes a polynomial degree six in these six parameters. So, so Steiner's conclusion was that we need to intersect this like sigma one takes sigma two, sigma three, sigma four, sigma five. And this is just gonna be this product of these five conditions that is gonna be like just six to the fifth, we just multiply the degrees, that is seven, 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 six, okay? So, 
So before saying a little bit more about this number that people know in this problem know that this is not correct, let me say how the second approach to this problem that's due to Shaz in 1864, then he said something like this, okay? So instead of wondering about what the conic is, so he said immediately this. The sigma i condition, so the, the same condition as before, is sort of equivalent to this. So twice, so 2p plus 2l, where by p I mean the condition of meeting a point, and l is the condition of um, being tangent tangent to a given line. Okay, so we're still talking about conditions. So, and what he said was, okay, we want to intersect five of these. So this is the same as taking 2L, 2P plus 2L to the fifth. That is equal to, maybe I have space here, 32 times P to the fifth times 5P to the fourth L plus 10 P cubed L squared plus all the other monomials. So in the end, it is L to the fifth. Okay, so we sort of moved this product to, to a sum of monomials of this kind. And then it just evaluated every single monomial by itself. So it's easy to see that P to the fifth is just how many conics are, contain five given points, five general points, so th there is only one conic like this. And keeping going, satisfying this condition, so passing through four points and being tangent to one line, there is there, is, there are two, there are four like this, so, and then four, two, one. Okay, so in the end, this gives the number 3,264, okay? There is a different answer than before, okay? So, and, and here, this is how, like how they used to work, like moving, like doing stuff like this and then taking the sum product without really wondering what really was, what was happening, okay? So, in the like 19th century, people like then started to actually prove this statement. But before, they were only like manipulation of these like letters and something like this, really. So, so I want to say a little bit of what's behind these two methods. So, so instead of like what's behind, I want to say like how this stuff has been translated in the following century, in the 20th century. So. So how to prove something like this? So the, the key point of all of this, so in the 20th century, people got used to the idea that to prove statements like this, we need to have a moduli space. And a moduli space that is actually compact. That's the best idea. So there is a quote by Angelo Vistoli that says that trying to work with a non-compact moduli space is like trying to keep your coins, your change coins in your pocket when you have a hole at the end of your pocket, okay? That's, so we need to, we, we really want a compact moduli space. So in particular, we, we consider a space of smooth conics in P2, and we want to compactify it. So we want a compactification. Okay, so the first approach by Steiner it's clearly saying that so that so let's call this this like u. It's clearly saying that we consider u inside p5, and then these like conditions translate into five, and inside p5 we have five sigma one, sigma two until sigma five. We have five um, five degree six hypersurfaces they correspond to like all conics tangent to one of the given ones. And, and then he said, okay, we consider the intersection of this, and by Bezu, this is going to be 7,776 7, points. The problem is, th there is one problem here. The problem is that this intersection of this, C, of this five hypersurface is actually equal to gamma that is like a bunch of bunch of points, union a surface. And that's gonna be the surface of double lines. So if you think about it, um, 
if we express this condition, the condition of being tangent to a conic as like having the intersection with this conic non reduced, then if we consider a double line, like twice a line, this is going to be tangent to every conic. Because the intersection, of course, is, not go is go going to be non reduced. So, so this surface is going to be containing all these five surfaces. So the intersection is not going to be just a bunch of points. In particular, this means the intersection of these five surfaces is not transverse, and so we cannot use Bezu. Okay? So in this case, so we, what we really want is the cardinality of this gamma set of points, but what we get is, just, is a number that also includes these surfaces. So as, as I read in a paper that I think is by Steve Kleiman, this number has no enumerative significance. And um, that means it doesn't, it doesn't count anything. So, so that's why Stein, Steiner was wrong, okay? Because the intersection has something wrong at, along the surface S. So, so what's behind, like, Schauser construction is the following. So we consider, so the idea, the main idea is to consider the dual conic. So what do I mean by dual conic? So if I consider a, a conic in P2, then its dual conic is a curve that I'm going to call C star inside P2 dual. And P2 dual is going to be the, the space of all lines in P2. Is the curve consisting of tangent lines to C. And incidentally, in this case, happens to be another conic, so a conic in P2 dual. So, so what Schauser did is the following. We consider U, instead of inside P5, instead of P5, cross P5 dual, OK? So we, we take a conic C, and we send it to, mm, so let's call this like phi, we, we send it to the couple of the conic and the dual of the conic. So, and by this, I mean, so a conic is given by a polynomial in P5, and a dual conic is given by a polynomial in this other space, OK? And so, it, so what's behind this construction is considering x, that is just the, the closure of the image of u under this map, that is called the space of complete conics, OK? So let's, that's like a definition, OK? So a few remarks about this space. So the first remark that people may immediately wonder about is that this x is not isomorphic to is not isomorphic to p5. It's substantially different. And other, other remarks are that in this in this x we can consider like line bundles of this form. So let's let's give a name. Let's call O of A B on X like the, the pullback from the first projection of O of A tensor like um, the, pull, the pullback from the second coordinate of O P5 star of B, OK? So that's just to, have, just to give some notation. So then we have that the, our condition like P, so the condition of being tangent to, to meet a point is now, is now like a section of O of 1, 0. L is a section of O of 0, 1. And of course, our, like, like, like our sigma, sigma i that we had before, is a section of O of 2, 2, OK? So we are working in a different space. And so it, it happens that we have this relation that Shazel had at the beginning, OK? And then we can work some intersection theory in this space. And we can find out that the degree, the self, top self intersection of this divisor is actually 32, 64. OK? So something I want to say is that considering also the dual conic is really what we want to do in order to solve such a question, because the dual conic talks about tangent lines to the conic. And we are asking a question about tangency. So this is like a, something we should really take care of. We should really consider when answering questions like this. So something else I want to say about these complete conics is that, is that now there are, there are two boundary components. So we are taking this, this U, and we are compactifying it. 
So in the first case, for P5, we added to it the, the discriminant hypersurface. Okay, we are in P5, we have a discriminant hypersurface of degree three, and that's like an irreducible like, hypersurface that we attach to U, okay? And so the boundary is only one component. In this case, there are two boundary components. So in, the, in this case, so X minus U is just the union of, let's call them E1 and E2, actually, I prefer delta one and delta two, two, two irreducible boundary components that, by the way, individually are also smooth and transverse. Okay, so they intersect transversely. Okay? So that's something that we didn't have before. So the discriminant the surface here is not smooth. But in that case, it is. So, and actually, so there is a way to, to look at these two divisors. So we are considering couples of conics, like conic and dual conic. So there is a way to look at this delta one divisor that is like this. So let's consider a conic. We can degenerate this conic to be the union of two concurrent lines. And when we have a conic degenerating to this, so the, this is like, there is like a point P, what we have, the dual conic degenerates to, that's easy to check by some calculations, to, to a double line. So in the dual space, a line corresponds to a point, so this line is sort of like corresponding to our point P, okay? So that's delta one, and of course there is also like the other situation when we have the dual conic degenerated to to, to the lines and, and the conic itself degenerating to a double line, okay? So these are two boundary divisors and in particular you see that, so this stuff is new from what we had before because the, the, this space of compliconics sees more structure all over this, okay? That's, that, but what the point I want to make is that their construction, everything they did was relying very heavily on these boundary divisors, okay? So is these, like, these like boundary divisors that they, they used to call degenerations were fundamental tool to solve this problem. So what, what I mean by this is that, is that Shazel here probably didn't have in mind the whole space of complete conics, but he did have in mind that in this space there were two boundary components, delta, delta one and delta two, two like degenerations. As he, he worked with this as like the, the condition, this condition and this condition, and he relied pretty, pretty, pretty heavily on, on those two, okay? So there is, there is a parenthesis that I need to open now. So let's say here about like a similar construction to this. So, so about complete collinations. That's a parenthesis I need to open, and I hope I'm going to close it as soon as possible. So mm, there is a construct. So let's consider now PGLN. And we want to compactify PGLN. So there is, there is a quite easy choice that we can use. So there is one option is just to consider PGL, PGLN inside PN squared minus 1. Okay, that's but the natural choice is like what everybody thinks about at first. But there is, a different, there is a different choice that we can make that's called the complete collinations that actually is very similar to the construction we did before. And it works like this. So we embed PGLN into the product P n squared minus 1 times some other, some other big projective spaces, so until p n squared minus one, so let's, let's call it like n2, n3, and so on. So these are big numbers that can be expressed in terms of some binomial coefficients. And we do like this, so we, put, we send a matrix A 
to like itself, then to the second exterior power of A. And by this, I mean a matrix whose, whose entries are all two by two minors of A. Then wedge three of A, and then all the way down to wedge n minus one of A. That, by the way, in the projective space is very related to just consider A inverse, okay? It's just like by multiplication by the, the determinant, or maybe, maybe, maybe not, but yeah, I think so, but I, I don't want to say anything. So, so there is a geometric feature of all of this. There are actually two geometric features of all of this. The first is this. So we consider A, instead of just A, we consider all these matrices, and in some sense, this matrix here is telling us the action of A on points. This, this here is telling us the action of, of A on lines. And, and so on, and going on, we arrive until here that this tells us something about the action of, of A on, on the hyperplanes. So, so there is a dramatic feature that says that every one of these components is sort of is telling us something specific about the action of, of like these, these automorphisms of Pn, okay? There is also another feature that is that this, so let me go here. So another feature, okay, let's first, let's say that, let's call, I'm gonna use this very bad notation, PGLN bar to indicate the closure of the image. So the space of complete collinations. And so and th that, of course, is not a very well-defined notation, but it's going to be it's gonna be coherent for, this, for the, the aim of this talk. And so this PGLN bar is also equal to this. It's also isomorphic to this. So we start from PN squared minus 1. So inside PN, PN squared minus 1, we have all the, all the straight lines inside here, like ZN minus 1, all the way to Z2 and Z1, of matrices of a given rank, OK? So the general point in here is a matrix of rank of rank n, and then we have matrices of rank n minus 1 until, uh, until to 1, when we take like all, all of pn minus 1, pn squared minus 1, I'm sorry. So did I make this mistake somewhere else? No. So what we do is to blow up inside here z1, OK? Then what we do is to blow up again, but what we blow up is z2, and actually we blow up its proper transform, OK? And we go all the way down until we blow up the proper transform after all these iterations of Zn minus 2. Because Zn minus 1 doesn't make so much sense to blow up because it's just a, di a divisor. Z1 is rank 1, sorry. So Ti is like matrices of rank i closure. OK? So. Yes, precisely. So. So all of these theories, so that these, these of, so, so this, this construction that actually resembles in some way the one we did here, falls actually under like a large class of examples of wonderful compactifications that there is a, I mean, they were brought to light by a paper of De Concini and in 1983 that, I mean, they, did, they do this contraction for a quite large class of like spaces, like they produce a compactification like this. And by the way, when I say wonderful compactification, I mean that together with this feature, we have another feature that is that PGLN bar minus PGLN is the union of, and I believe I need to stop at N minus one, uh, is, is the union of n minus one, minus one boundary divisors, divisors, um, all that are smooth and transverse. And whenever we have a compactification that satisfies this hypothesis, we say that is a wonderful compactification. I mean, that's not that. So it's. I mean, I also believe that they're wonderful, but I mean that's. On everybody's choice, but so and by the way, so E1 here is just the the proper transform of the 
of the exceptional divisors of the first blow up, and E2 and go on, and E n minus 1 is just the locus of rank n minus 1 matrices that we didn't blow up because it was the divisor. So basically, E i sort of corresponds to rank i matrices, OK? Yes, divided with a spherical homogeneous space, yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's a way, way wider class of situations where we have a compatibility, but that's all I'm going to need. So, OK. So let's go finally to talk about twisted cubics, OK? So what happened is that we, we still have three questions over there. So what happened is that Schubert came in 1879 and sort of like killed all the fun because he answered like all the possible questions you can have in mind about twisted cubics and way more, OK? So he wrote a book, entire book, where he solved all sort of enumerative problems. And in particular, these three are among those, OK? So as I said before, mm, under, under the rug, it's very important to look at the boundary divisors, at the degenerations we want, we, we are considering, OK? So that, that's considering two degenerations here is how we, we like, we're really able to find the right answer, OK? So what Schubert did was, so I, he degenerated twisted cubics in 11 different ways. So, I mean, we had two for conics. He degenerated them in 11 different ways. That's really plenty. So first, so instead of just considering the twisted cubic, so let's say we have C in P3, a twisted cubic. As we did before, so before we said, let's move to the dual conic. Here, we can move to both, like we have this curve that I'm going to call like C with an upper two here inside the Grassmannian of lines in P3. That is the curve composed by all lines that are tangent to C, OK? So curve of tangent lines. And then we can also consider some sort of C3 here in P3 dual. By P3 dual, I mean the space of all planes. And we, can, we consider all the planes that intersect our twisted cubic in one non-reduced point of multiplicity 3, OK? So a general plane is going to meet the twisted cubic in three points. Some special planes are going to meet the twisted cubic in one point of multiplicity 2 and another one. And there are some special planes that are going to meet the twisted cubic in one point. So I call these planes um, osculating, osculating planes. And actually, this, this like, so the locus here of osculating planes it happens to be exactly a twisted cubic in P3 dual. A twisted cubic, OK? So this, this is a twisted cubic itself. And just for sake of information, this is a rational normal, rational normal quartic. So, so I'm going to show you some, some of these degenerations. So for instance, so let's start with from like our twisted cubic, then this rational normal quartic, and then the, the dual twisted cubic. So let's degenerate them in some way. So the, the most known degenerations of a twisted cubic are the degeneration of the twisted cubic onto like a plain nodal rational cubic. And there is also an embedded point. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. So when this degenerates here, the curve rational tangent the of tangent lines is degenerates to a plane tricuspidal quartic. And the curve of osculating plane that I'm going to call briefly the dual curve degenerates to the union of three concurrent lines. So some other thing we can do is to degenerate the twisted cubic to the union of a line and a conic meeting. So these two are the most known sort of degenerations. So in this case, the, this curve degenerates to the union of a double line and a conic. And the dual curve degenerates to a triple line. 
So, but we can do also something else. For instance, we can say, what happens if we, if we have the dual curve degenerating to, to a nodal cubic, to a, to a nodal plane cubic? Then, I mean, it's not so hard to imagine that the curve is gonna, that the curve of tangent lines degenerates to another curve like this. So three cuspidal quartic, planar quartic, and this, the twisted cubic set gener degenerates here. Something even funnier, we can have, we can consider this, the, the curve of, of tangent lines degenerating to four concurrent lines. And, and in this case, both the cubic, and the cubic, the twisted cubic, and the dual twisted cubic degenerate to a triple line. Okay. So Schubert also gave names to these degenerations. He called this lambda, this omega, this mm, this lambda dual, and this I believe eta. It's easy to say this is lambda dual. We are, we're just switching the order, okay? And there is a lot of like symmetry in this way, so considering this, this stuff. So, and there are other, other seven that are be beautifully described by a paper of Ragni that's here, so a paper that I believe is from 82. There is also another description way earlier by Algunade, I don't know if I pronounce this, this name in a right way, in, in 56. He was more interested in sort of like Chow variety stuff. And Ragni was more interested in Hilbert scheme stuff, okay? So that's a complete description. It's a beautiful paper. And there is like the whole picture with all 11, okay? So, so what happened to twisted cubic? So, and actually, and by the way, Schubert answered the, all the, the three questions that we have at the blackboard. I'm sorry, I, need to, I, I need, had to write them down. So the first question has answered 56960. The second question has answer 80160, and the third question has answer huh, 58195397836680. Okay, that's a huge number, and all of these three have been proven correct later. Okay, so what happened later to twisted cubics? So, as we said before, later so the 20th century attempts to deal with these problems were finding, we're about finding a modular space, a compact modular space. So later, compact modular space. So, so a way to, so there are two main ways that have been followed to find this. So the first way is to say, okay, so how can I consider a modular space for twisted cubic? How can I deform, how can I move a twisted cubic? And one way is to move, is to change the defining, defining polynomials. So, so usually the twisted cube is defined by three quadratic polynomials in P2, in P3, and we can vary these polynomials. And that's basically the idea behind the, the Hilbert scheme. So the Hilbert scheme has been widely studied. I believe that in the last decade, uh, there was finally somebody that, that wrote down explicitly like the full Chow ring of the Hilbert scheme. And by Hilbert scheme, I mean the component of the Hilbert scheme containing this as a general point. So it's, I mean, after a few papers that, so, uh, so now, I mean, there is a complete description of the Chow ring of this space. But something I want to say is that what's the boundary of this in this case, okay? So we are always compactifying. So we have like our space of twisted cubics And we want to compactify this. So in this, in this case, the boundary has two irreducible components, so two boundary components. And they basically correspond to the, the generation lambda and the generation omega that Schubert wrote. Okay? So, so this space has sort of the same problem as this, the P5 we use for conics, that if we consider them like sort of triple lines, they are all, always going to be tangent to everything, okay? So this base has sort of the same problems as P5 had for conics. So another way is to modify, modify the map from P1 to P3. And this is like the full history of, the history of like, mm, 
the moduli space of stable maps. So there is, of course, so this let, studying like how the map changes the embedding of P1 to P3, I mean, is the whole study of moduli space of stable maps, and there is, I mean, I, I won't deny how important they have been in the math of the last, I don't know, 30 or 40 years. And, and many of these questions have been actually proved in this way, okay? So what I want to do is to do something different, okay? Um, instead of doing any of these, I do this. So I, I move the twisty cubic by linear automorphisms of, of P3, okay? So instead of like moving the twisty cubic itself, I consider like linear automorphism of P3 and see what happens to the twisty cubic after applying this. So, so if I consider the space of twisty cubics, the, of, like the, the smooth ones, I have like sort of an action of, of PGL4 on it, okay? That moves all of them. So what happens when I take a family of automorphisms and I degenerate, and I degenerate them? So now is the time to draw a little bit some pictures. Oh, that's the thing I shouldn't have erased, but that's not. So, so let's see. So example one, let's consider like the family of automorphisms of P3 given by this, okay? So that's like phi t, okay? So what happens if I apply phi t to t, this is gonna be, so let's say c, my twisty cubic. So we can see that this is actually a family of automorphisms that sort of push, so as t goes to zero, I'm pushing away from a point onto a plane, okay? So this is a family of automorphisms that starts from a point and moves and like sort of pushes away onto a plane. Okay, so what happens if I have a twisty cubic? If I have a twisty cubic and I push it down, it's gonna get more and more like flat, and in the end it's gonna become like a nodal cubic in P3. Another cubic, another plane cubic, okay? So basically, doing this game here, so projecting away from a point and onto a plane is how I basically get this degeneration lambda. So what, what if I do like, let me hit this. What if I do, if I, if I project away, so if I take a family of automorphisms that's like this, okay? So this is something that projects away from a line and onto a, another line. And it's not hard to see that if I keep doing the same game as before, I have a twisty cubic, I, I push it, and, and in the end it's just gonna go all the way onto the line. And in fact, that's precisely the way in which I get this degeneration here, okay? So this, I, I get this degeneration considering a family of automorphism like this. So now there is another example I need to consider that is something like this. So in this way, in this, I'm projecting away from a plane onto a point, okay? And if I have now a twisty cubic, now the picture is going to become more and more complicated. So let's say I have a twisty cubic like this. Then if I keep pushing it, this is gonna go all the, to the point, but these three, the three point of intersection are going to stay the same. So basically what I'm gonna get is something like this. And in the very end, what I'm gonna get is just the union of three lines. And so that's precisely how I get this degeneration, okay? So I can obtain this degeneration if I can, if I, if I do something like this, but instead I start, I repel away from a point that's on the twisty cubic, okay? And changing like the relative position of like the repeller and the twisty cubic, I can get all the other degenerations, okay? So, so the point is, I consider families of automorphism and I see what happens when these degeneration, when these automorphisms degenerate, okay? So I see, so basically what I do is, 
what I can do is to consider sort of like the action of a compactification of PGL4 on the space of complete of, of, of twisted cubics. Okay. So what's going to happen in the very end is that I'm going to take the space of twisted cubic. So the space of twisted cubics is PGL4 mod PGL2 because that's just like the action is transitive and stabilized and is isomorphic to PGL2. But I want to consider like not only what happens at the twisted cubic when I move it by an automorphism of PGL4, but I also allow this automorphism to degenerate to, to an automorphism that is, that is not anymore full rank. That is not an automorphism anymore. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is to put here in my diagram a compactification of space of twisted cubics that's gonna be PGL4 compactified divided by PGL2. Actually, there's going to be a GIT process to make, and there's going to be a choice of linearization, but that's what, I want, what I'm going to do. Okay? So now, let me say a couple of things about the space of complete collinations, something I already, I've already said before, but let me, let, me say, let me say it again in a more compact way. So to, to arrive to the definition of my space of complete twisted cubics. So, so we start from PGL4 bar that, again, is sits inside P15 times P35 times P15. So remember A, the, the, the second wedge power of A and the third. And also PG, PGL4 is also equal to the blow up of, so a double blow up of, of P15. Okay, so and from here we get the boundary divisor E1. From here we get the boundary divisor E2. And and we have E3, that's all, there are all the matrices of rank three. Okay, let me write it on the back here. Rank three matrices. So, so what happens in this space? So first, um, the Picard group of this PGL4 bar is isomorphic of all, of like, all like O of A, B, C, for A, B, C in, in Z. So basically, all line bundles of these are precisely all the possible like pullbacks. I mean, the tensor product of all possible pullbacks of O of N of, of a certain line bundles from the three projections, okay? So basically, it's the entire Picard group of this space restricted to X straight. So then, um, let me also point out that E1 is a section of O of 2, negative 1, 0. E2 is a section of O, negative 1, 2, negative 1. And, o, and E3 is a section of O, 0, negative 1, 2. Okay, that's maybe it's gonna, we're going to need that later. Okay? So what we do is this. So we consider, again, C a twisted cubic in P3. And we consider PGL2 its stabilizer. And, and then PGL2, so of course, acts on, on PGL4, but it also acts on PGL4 bar. Because the action extends to all the, all the boundary. That's pretty easy because actually the, the action of PGL4 extends to the boundary. And also PGL2 also acts on all line bundles of A, B, C, such that A plus C is even, okay? so. Because otherwise the, the action is only of SL2. Okay, there's some situation like that. So, so then we are ready to give my definition. So the space, so the space of complete twisted cubics is X. That is just this the GIT quotient of PGL4 bar more PGL2 with linear choice of linearization O of 1, 1, 1, okay? So that's a pretty natural choice. And also going to look actually to study the semi-stable and the unstable locals for this map, they, they, are, they like look nice enough, okay? So sometimes people want to scramble these numbers as much as possible, but in this case, 1, 1 works well. I mean, I have in mind to look what happens for a different linearization, but I still haven't done it. So, so then, 
let's look at this x, OK? So, so x, x, of course, is a compactification with space of, smooth, of twisted cubics. And the boundary is the union, like delta 1 union delta 2 union delta 3. And they, that come from, so three irreducible components meeting generically transversely. And, and these three divisors come from the three boundary divisors of PGL4. So actually, this corresponds to, so we remember what happened when we were applying. So E1 are the matrices of rank 1, so sort of like this situation. And in fact, that delta 1 that we get over there is sort of like relating to this degeneration of the twisted cubic. So this is sort of like. Um, I, my plan was to talk about it a little later, but the answer is no. That is not moved. Um, so, OK, so let, let me not claim anything about that. OK, so, but I mean, at the general point where this is smooth, the intersection is adversely, OK, so away from the, from the smooth focus. I, mean, I, I guess I can talk about generic stuff, even if it's not smooth. OK, unless it's smooth like in codimension zero, but that's not, that's, that doesn't happen. So, that's, so the first divisor is sort of like this situation. The second is when, what, what happens when I, Consider like a, a rank two map, so it's something is related to this eta here. So that we need to cons to think about this as this degeneration of twisted cubics, and this as like lambda. Okay, when I apply um, an automorphism of like I mean linear transformation of rank three, I, I get in a situation like this generically. Okay, so we we see these three boundary divisors. So that's different from what we got before. Okay, so the the main feature of this, of this space, is this. So that's like probably the main thing of the entire talk. Is this? So if we consider L equals O of the line bundle, like a tier divisor on 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 this space X, then there exists an algorithm. I know that sounds a little funny as theorem that finds um, that the degree of this device, or D, this device or D raised to the 12th power, OK? The top intersection product, OK? And I mean, by there is an algorithm. It means that I have this algorithm in my, in my computer. And for every device like that, I can run it and get a number, OK? So I'm going to describe you like how this how this algorithm works. Um, no, I really don't. I mean, no, I really don't think so. So, um, no. I mean, th there are a few issues that that are gonna be, that, I, that I'm gonna talk about a little later. So, so just re quickly, how how this algorithm works. So. So the first is that the first step is that this integral over x, the degree of this x of d to the 12, is actually equal to 12 factorial times the limit as n goes to infinity of the number of sections of. Okay, so I need to say that here this is like this is like base point three, and h naught of of like n times this line bundle over n to the 12th, OK? So that's something that is not, sometimes this is called like asymptotic Riemann-Roch theorem or something. Maybe with the, that's always true with maybe the Euler characters, I'm not sure. But, but that's actually not hard to prove, considering like Hilbert functions and games like this. So, so I move from a question like this to a question like this, only studying the number of sections of certain line bundles and only studying the asymptotic behavior. So step two is that if L lifts 
to O of ABC in PGL4 bar, then, um, then H naught of X and L is equal to a given, so is equal, so, to the direct sum of V A prime, B prime, C prime, tensor V. Okay, I'm gonna explain everything, what, what this means. So star PGL2 invariant where, okay, so I'm gonna need to cancel this. Where, so for A prime, B prime, C prime, in some sort of polyhedra, A gamma of ABC. So basically V, A prime, B prime, C prime, is the irreducible representation of, of PGL4 with, with highest weight like A omega 1 plus B omega 2 plus C omega 3. So what I'm basically saying is that this, I'm giving a complete, so I consider the action of PGL4 on this space and I split it into irreducible representations. And and the, every one of these appears with multiplicity given by the dimension of this space. And the, the representation up here, and this is some sort of given, this is the intersection of, is the intersection of a polygon and a lattice, okay? So it's just like a bunch of points, in, a bunch of entire integer points inside a certain polygon. I'm not gonna explain so much more than this because there's no time, but I gave a complete description of this, then that was a very nice picture, but I'm gonna erase it. So, then step three, step three was to find, find a function capital F of A, B, C, such that this function asymptotically agrees with the dimension of V of A, B, C, tensor V, A, B, C, dual, PGL2. So, and by the way, so here I use a little bit of representation theory, and basically the representation theory related to PGL4 bar. So this is a space that's very well known, like quite a lot. So most of what I say comes from the knowledge that people have about this space, okay? So find a function like this. So this is a function that tells me sort of the asymptotic behavior, the dimension of these guys. So basically now my limit so my limit now becomes, so here, yeah, so that's maybe without the end here. So basically, this now became, becomes just the sum of the dimension of these for many different integer points, okay? So basically the sum of, so, so basically this step four, so my limit, my integral be, becomes just the limit or n goes to infinity of the sum of this like f of a, b, c, so if inside this polygon, so inside n times this polygon divided by n to the 12. And what I, what I can do is basically to rescale, so that's 12 factorial here. To rescaling this, I can make this limit into a Riemann sum, and what in the end I, I get is 12 factorial over four times the integral over this polygon, now just the polygon of like f, okay? And I created this polynomial and most of the time we're devolved to actually find this polynomial. That's like a piecewise polynomial, is, uh, yeah, piecewise polynomial function of degree nine. And, and but once I have this function, then I can just ask Mathematica to find me integrals of this, okay? So, so what are the results? coming after this. So this is how the, the algorithm works. So what happened afterwards? So, so I did this. I considered, so. How much time do I have? Okay, so um, I considered this, D being the twisted cubics um, tangent to a plane. I considered P minus one of D, this is a section of O of four zero zero in PGL four, in PGL four bar. So basically what I had to do is to find 12 factorial over four 
the integral over this like polyhedra depending on 400 of f in dv. And what I found here was precisely 56960. That is the right answer. Okay. Something else that I did, I mean, there are a few comments I need to make about this, but another thing is that if I consider twisted cubic meeting a line, um, this pulls back to like a section of all 0, 3, 0. And if I play, if I do the same thing, so just like my algorithm, I get, I get a number that sadly is not the right number, but that, this number here. So, so there are a few issues with this process. So I do get the intersection product, but there are a few issues that I need to take care of. I mean, the intersection product itself is not really the only answer. It's not, uh, unless we, we prove some result of transversality, it's not really the, the right, mm, it's not really enough to, to say we have a proof. So there are actually two issues. The first issue is that um, the space X is sadly, is very far, I mean, X has a pretty bad singularity along along a codimension six, like sub variety y. Um, and actually, this makes it also so x is not even q Cartier. That means it's not true that if we take a divisor, we have like a multiple of it that is a Cartier divisor. So, so I'm working on solving this, but I believe that it's possible. Okay, I need to say the words because the, there's not so much time left. So I believe that it is possible to make a very small modification to x that, that is like solving some sort of toric singularity that makes all of this still work and makes the space into a Q Cartier space, okay? So sorry, I, I cannot say anything more than this. So the second, the second issue is that a few times, sometimes we have like, um, we, we have base loci. So, so, and that's of course the case that we have, that's of course the case that happens here. And actually what I'm working on, and actually I did succeed in, in a few cases, so I'm working on a modification of the algorithm of the algorithm that works for the, that involves blowing up some loci inside my space X, okay? So, and, and I did it in a few cases, I need to give some general formula. So, so let me say in, in the last minute what I aim to do, like how I keep, I, I plan to keep working on this. So first, first, so like aims. So first, like, like working out these blow ups that in one hand are gonna be able to solve these two issues and the other hand are gonna get me closer to the picture that Schubert had in mind of having 11 boundary divisors. I mean, I don't believe I'm gonna, I, I would like to get to 11, but adding a few more might, might help, especially for the enumerative geometry side. The second is to study a little bit deeper the theory of, in general, embeddings of PGL4 over PGL2, the theory of compa or equivalent compatification of PGL4 over PGL2. So in, in nicer case, so in cases, in, in a bunch of cases of G mod H, there is a complete description of all equivalent compatifications. For instance, think about the, the toric varieties, but if we extend to like spherical varieties that are like, um, like some sort of a, a condition that includes also toric varieties, there's still a, co a classification of all um, equivalent embeddings. This is not a case that falls under this hypothesis, so there is not at all a description of this, but the description of oligar embeddings also relates to sort of like understanding what boundary divisors K 
can appear, okay? So, and my first aim at the beginning was to find out why Schubert got precisely 11 degenerations. Like, why 11? So is it something intrinsic to this quotient, the number 11? So understanding more deeply the theory of all equivalent embeddings might give some, might give some, some like, reason why there is this number 11. And the third aim, and sorry if I, I took one minute more, is to study, to, to pass to another case, that is the case PGL6 bar over PGL3. There is, the, there is a space parameterizing Veronese surfaces, okay? And now, for twisted cubics, uh, uh, there are many moduli spaces known. All the questions have been answered already, but in, that, in this case of Veronese surfaces, the answers are way more rare. And I believe, I mean, this is a way that can be followed basically until the end. And it might give some answers that still nobody has given before. And, and maybe, I mean, who knows how many boundary devices we can find like a la Schubert. So, and that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you.